Hello and welcome from the First United Methodist Church in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Right now, I'm standing in a very light rain, which is welcome. And I'm also standing at um, a Wawa in the parking lot next to an electric charger, which is charging, you can see it, my new electric car. And I know that some of the people that are watching this are shaking their heads. Actually, almost everybody is. There are going to be some people who have said, okay, I've got a charger myself and I've been doing this for a couple years. What's the big deal? And there are other people who are going to be saying, what's all this wokeism going on? Why did you waste your money on that? I'm going to leave all of that aside on both viewpoints there and simply look at it this way. I am in my first day of owning an electric car. And this is something that's, eh, for me, a little bit new and a little bit scary. How far can I go with it? Um, how high do I have to keep the charge? I have a charger at home, but it's not going to go anywhere near as fast as this one. And we're going to be talking about Abraham today and some of the ways in which he had to step out and along with a lot of others. Uh, remember that phrase, we're going to get it along with a lot of others, had to do a whole lot of new things. And he was, believe it or not, considerably older than I. Not that I'm that old. Although they did give me a senior citizen discount at a diner last night. Even though I said I didn't deserve it, somehow they keep defining senior citizen down. Um, most times it doesn't bother me. But for some reason last night it did. Anyhow, I'm going way off base. Let's get back to what we should be doing together, which is worship. This comes to us from chapter 12 of the book of Genesis, verses 1 through 9. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and those who curse you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai, and his brother's son, Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they went forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land, 
Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country, to the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. There's a danger in preaching. And that is that people sometimes listen. And sometimes they actually might think about something you say. There's an old proverb that says, it's better to be silent and be thought an idiot than to open up your mouth and prove it. And I'm not going down that road today. But I do want to thank somebody who was listening to something I said last week, or not so much even what I said, but who was listening to what was in the Bible and who asked me a question that got me thinking about some things this week. The question was not about how Abraham and Sarah Abram and Sarai could have had a child so late in life, because God does miracles all the time of one sort or another. But it was a question that came from a, a practical reality, one that really would only come from a grandparent. And it was about how a couple that age the age of Abraham and Sarah, could have handled a child once it was born. By the way, have I said Happy Father's Day yet? Happy Father's Day, because that's the Sunday that this sermon comes up. And I'm not going to ask anybody for a show of hands. But of grandparents generally, and um, just to take Abram's age when he and his folks set off from Haran, let's say people over 75, whether they're grandparents or not, how many of them, maybe how many of you, could picture themselves raising a child? And yes, it's great to be able to hold a newborn baby. And it's great to rock a child and sing it to sleep. And those are, are tremendous things that are ageless. It's, it brings a joy that you will see on the face of a kid's little or well, not little, but big sister or brother, when, when the parents take this baby and put it in, in the brother or sister's arms and say, here, you can hold the, hold the baby for a little while. And, and you can see the mix of, of nervousness and of joy, of welcome and of apprehension. All of that right there in that child's face. And sometimes you see the same same things in the face of an older person, a grandparent, a great-grandparent, an older neighbor, an aunt, an uncle, whoever it is. And for those few minutes, all of that is there. But after that child dozes off and has had some sleep and wakes up again, the kid has a completely different agenda. And so if you're really taking care of this child, you're dealing with sleepless nights, changing diapers and infant care, and following up later with the business of learning to walk and to speak of, of 
potty training and the terrible twos. And you get those endless questions that come from a three and a four and even a five-year-old. Why? How come? Where? Who? When was that? Where did it go? Is that going to happen again? Is that real? All of those questions over and over, day after day, and the care goes on with something new every day until the child is no longer a child. We've got about two decades. And parents take care of this stuff and more. But parents do that when they're young and energetic and when their knees don't make strange sounds at odd and unexpected moments. And yes, there are grandparents who take on that responsibility when they need to. God bless them. I mean that. God bless them. Have we said Happy Father's Day yet? But anyway, somebody asked that question. How on earth did Sarah and Abraham take care of baby Isaac at their age? Fortunately, that's a question that I could, I could answer pretty easily because the Bible answers it. They had servants. They had people to help them out. Abram, we're told, was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. Abram, for his age, was not a poor man. He left Haran, a settled town, and he became a nomad. But a nomad may be quite prosperous. One reason a nomad has to keep moving is because the sheep and the goats, the flocks and the herds, keep multiplying. And that is a nomad's wealth. There are limits on it, but the limits have to do with where you can find pasture and, and where you can find water and how you can protect the flocks and herds from wild animals and from natural hazards and from other nomads or rustlers of all types. No, Abraham did not have a family in the strict sense, in the biological sense. But he was the head of a household. And he and Sarah had people around them that they could rely on who were part of that household. The first step of faith that we talk about being taken by Abraham was indeed a first step. And a second step was taken by Sarah, who went with him. And another step was taken by Lot, his nephew who went with both of them, and then by others who may or may not even have had much choice in the matter. Those persons whom they had acquired in Haran. That language to me sounds like it might have meant slaves. There was a whole network of people supporting their decision or God's decision made for them, that they should go out into the land. And for the sake of an unknown future and 
as yet unknown blessing through an as yet unborn child. And they would be even older when that child would finally, finally be born. In the life of Abram and Sarah, we see a couple to whom God promised a world-changing future because it would only happen the way it did with God involved. The miracle then of Isaac's birth to Sarah and Abram had to be sustained by both of them and by the people around them. And repeatedly in the Bible, repeatedly in the history of God's people, we even see it in the life of God's people around us in our own day. God works a miracle or two. God does something unexpected and occasionally just inexplicable. And then God takes this miracle and he hands it off to people like you or me, people that are a little too old to handle it, people that are too young to know what to do with it, people that are totally uneducated or unprepared, people who don't know what resources they have or plain outright don't have much. And God takes these miracles and hands them to people like that. Tony Campolo and his colleagues have done a lot of good in North Philadelphia over the years. If you don't know who he is and, and, and who the people around him have been, uh, go online and check it out. Over the years, they've done a lot of really meaningful urban ministry. And it has been ministry. It isn't just saying, oh, we're going to go in, we're going to build a house or something like that. No, it's people who actually go in and live with people and share their lives. And he tells story, stories about how important it is not to expect to be able to do things like that alone and how nobody should expect to follow Jesus in any situation without the help of other people also committed to following Jesus. In his book, Wake Up America, <laughs> yeah, it's a great title, and he did use the word wake. Wake up, America, he wrote. All of this only heightens our awareness of the need to create small groups of Christians who will work together to do the work of the kingdom. Such groups create what biblical scholars call koinonia, a special kind of fellowship that belongs to those who feel spiritual oneness in Christ. Groups that get together simply to ensure their own survival, they rarely last. But when a group has a mission that carries it beyond its own self-interest, its members usually find that their common ministry, common mission, cements them together. More importantly, we should note that it is only in the context of such intensely committed groups that a countercultural value system can be maintained and a clear understanding of what it means to be a radical Christian established. Unquote. What I find interesting 
And where I find the challenge is in the way that God not only sends people to uphold one another in these small groups. And it's not just for ministry in the inner city. It's for anybody's ministry in life. You need those groups, those supports. But God also even sends people to sustain those groups. I, I think of it kind of like um, a medieval cathedral. You know, you have the big walls that go up and they look beautiful and, and they are able to open up with the stained glass windows and all of that stuff and the, the roof beams that are just absolutely incredible. But the Gothic cathedrals only were able to get that high into the air because they discovered the practice of building buttresses, flying buttresses, arches that were outside the main building and holding it up like kitten props. So God sets things up. And so God sustains things and holds them up so that ministry can happen. So that lives of faith can be lived. I was um, a chaplain at Lancaster General Hospital for a few months. For those who are watching from a distance, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, Lancaster County is the heart of um, the Amish country. Sometimes people equate Pennsylvania Dutch and Amish. They're different. But the Amish are the um, hardcore Anabaptists who live the way that their ancestors lived, who try to stay off the grid as much as they can. Um, and they're avoidance of modern technology is not that they consider it evil, but that they see what it can do to people. And they look at it uh, kind of sideways and try to evaluate uh, how to live without getting caught up in all sorts of unfortunate things. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But sometimes using 19th century, 18th century, and older technology in the 21st century can land people in the emergency room. I don't know how often there is a buggy crash, a buggy and a car. And when that happens, the horsepower wins over the horse. And there's a lot of human damage. There are crashes that take place all the time. And it can be tragic. And when someone is brought into the emergency room and they come from the Amish community, Part of a chaplain's duty is to find this person's family and let them know what's going on. Do you know how hard it can be to get hold of Amos Esch in Quarryville or Jacob and Anna Smoker in Ronx? More of the Amish do have cell phones than you would expect or realize. But there are still times when they simply don't have them on or you don't have the number because you're not going to rely on that if you're Amish. It's for emergencies only. So then when an emergency comes up, what do you do? For the most part, you always have to know where they live or find out. And then you call 
one of their neighbors. And the neighbor will go out and find Mr. Esch or Mrs. Smucker, find them out in the field or at home, and let them know that they're needed at the hospital as soon as they can get there. And then that same neighbor will, in general, take them in their own car and get them there as quickly as they can and usually stay with them. I can remember one time when there was a man who was burning a brush pile and his beard caught on fire. And he put it out as best as he could. And then he finished burning the brush pile because you got chores to be done. But his face was terribly, terribly burned, like I'm third degree burns, serious burns. And when he got to the emergency room, people looked at him and said, we can't handle this. You need to go to the burn center at Crozier Hospital in Chester. And these guys have no idea where Chester is. Uh, for those of you watching from a distance, it's just southwest of Philadelphia and northeast of Wilmington, right on the Delaware. And it's got a really good burn center, but you have to get somebody from Lancaster to Chester. And then, while they're there, somebody is going to have to take care of the farm until they're discharged. And while they're there in that foreign territory, somebody will have to take care of the kids because the wife is going to want to go down to be with him and to stay there for a while in a place where she doesn't know anybody or anything. And, and the staff at the hospital is going to have to be understanding about the way that she will more than likely camp out on the floor with him in the unit. Because there's no easy way of going back and forth to Lancaster County like somebody with a car might do. Situation after situation like this arises for the Amish, but they do what they do and they stick to what they're known for. Because it's part of their faith. It's part of how they are determined to walk with God. It's part of the simplicity that they seek. And it's not easy. And I still remember how one Amish woman said to me, as she and about 15 or 20 others were on their way out of the emergency room after a terrible tragedy. And she said to me, you know, we could never live the way we live without help from the outside. We could never live the way we live without help from the outside. My question that all begins with this business of Abraham and Sarah taking care of little baby Isaac, uh, my question would be whether there really is an inside or an outside after all. Where do you draw that line when the outsider is helping take care and, and making your faith walk possible? Can any individual survive out in the woods on their own without human contact for very long? The answer is no. I mean, that one's obvious. Can any nuclear family manage without some kind of extended family or some community backing them up? Again, it can be done, maybe, 
but the results are usually not very good. Can a community truly be self-sufficient, even if it could? Would everybody who is part of that community want to be isolated all the time? And I know I'm jumping ahead in the story of Abraham and Sarah and the care that their household members offered to one little child, presumably. But all of that might even have turned out to be all for nothing when two generations later, there was a famine in the promised land. And if it had not been for Abraham's great-grandson, Joseph, having access to grain that was stored in Egypt, they would all have starved. The connections that he had saved the day. And ended up saving a people that could go on and on and on into the future, into God's promised future, into the future that God had shown to Abraham, into a future where they were a people trusting God and helping one another. And it's always been because people trust God and help one another that God's people and God's purpose move forward into a future where one of the members of their group gives his life for all people. Like I said, I'm getting ahead in the story, but how can I not? God's purpose did and God's purpose does move forward, growing wider and wider and wider all the time because Jesus has opened it up and brought it right out into the open, like a flower opening from a bud. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It isn't just one family, understood in the most narrow way. It isn't just parents and children, or in this case, parents and child, that make up that promise. Or even the extended household. It isn't even just one clan or tribe or nation that ends up being blessed. It's all of us. And in the deepest way, it came to fullness when Abram and Sarah's miraculous family had another miraculous birth. And God put himself into the hands of people, well, of people. But a major moment on that journey was the one when Sarah handed her newborn Isaac to somebody, to another woman in the household, so that she could take a quick and much needed nap. And at his age, I bet Abraham could have used a nap too. In fact, 
I understand that a nap makes an excellent Father's Day present. Have I said Happy Father's Day yet? Happy Father's Day. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen.